Section twenty nine of Gray's Anatomy, Part five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part five by Henry Gray. The Kidneys, Part two. Minute Anatomy. The renal tubules, of which the kidney is for the most part made up, commence in the cortical substance, and after pursuing a very circuitous course through the cortical and medullary substances, finally end up at the apices of the renal pyramids by open mouths, so that the fluid which they contain is emptied through the calluses into the pelvis of the kidney. If the surface of one of the papillae be examined with a lens, it will be seen to be studded over with minute openings, the orifices of the renal tubules, from sixteen to twenty in number, and if pressure be made on a fresh kidney, urine will be seen to exude from these orifices. The tubules commence in the convoluted part and renal columns as the renal corpuscles, which are small, rounded masses of a deep red color, varying in size, but of an average of about 0.2 millimeters in diameter. Each of these little bodies is composed of two parts, a central glomerulus of vessels and a membranous envelope, the glomerular capsule, capsule of Bowman, which is the small, pouch-like commencement of a renal tubule. The glomerulus is a lobulated network of convoluted capillary blood vessels, held together by scanty connective tissue. This capillary network is derived from a small arterial twig, the afferent vessel, which enters the capsule, generally at a point opposite to that at which the latter is connected with the tubule, and the resulting vein, the efferent vessel, emerges from the capsule at the same point. The afferent vessel is usually the larger of the two. The glomerular, or Bowman's capsule, which surrounds the glomerulus, consists of a basement membrane, lined on its inner surface by a layer of flattened epithelial cells, which are reflected from the lining membrane onto the glomerulus, at the point of entrance or exit of the afferent and efferent vessels. The whole surface of the glomerulus is covered with a continuous layer of the same cells, on a delicate supporting membrane. Thus, between the glomerulus and the capsule, a space is left, forming a cavity lined by a continuous layer of squamous cells. This cavity varies in size according to the state of secretion and the amount of fluid present in it. In the fetus and young subject, the lining epithelial cells are polyhedral or even columnar. The renal tubules, commencing in the renal corpuscles, present during their course many changes in shape and direction and are contained partly in the medullary and partly in the cortical substance. At their junction with the glomerular capsule, they exhibit a somewhat constricted portion, which is termed the neck. Beyond this, the tubule becomes convoluted, and pursues a considerable course in the cortical substance, constituting the proximal convoluted tube. After a time, the convolutions disappear, and the tube approaches the medullary substance in a more or less spiral manner, this section of the tubule has been called the spiral tube. Throughout this portion of their course, the renal tubules are contained entirely in the cortical substance, and present a fairly uniform caliber. They now enter the medullary substance, suddenly become much smaller, quite straight in direction, and dip down for a variable depth into the pyramids, constituting the descending limb of Henley's loop. Bending on themselves, they form what is termed the loop of Henley and reascending they become suddenly enlarged, forming the ascending limb of Henley's loop, and re-enter the cortical substance. This portion of the tubule ascends for a short distance, when it again becomes dilated, irregular, and angular. This section is termed the zigzag tubule. It ends in a convoluted tube, which resembles the proximal convoluted tubule, and is called the distal convoluted tubule. This again terminates in a narrow junctional tube, which enters the straight or collecting tube. The straight or collecting tubes commence in the radiate part of the cortex, where they receive the curved ends of the distal convoluted tubules. They unite at short intervals with one another, the resulting tubes presenting a considerable increase in caliber, so that a series of comparatively large tubes passes from the bases of the rays into the renal pyramids. In the medulla, the tubes of each pyramid converge to join a central tube duct of Bellini, which finally opens on the summit of one of the papillae. The contents of the tube are therefore discharged into one of the calluses. 
Structure of the renal tubules. The renal tubules consist of a basement membrane lined with epithelium. The epithelium varies considerably in different sections of the tubule. In the neck, the epithelium is continuous with that lining the glomerular capsule, and like it consists of flattened cells, each containing an oval nucleus. The two convoluted tubules, the spiral and zigzag tubules, and the ascending limb of Henley's loop, are lined by a type of epithelium which is histologically the same in all. The cells are somewhat columnar in shape and dovetail into one another of their lateral aspect. Each has a striated border near the lumen of the tube. Its inner part is granular and its outer portion vertically striated. The nucleus is spherical and situated about the center of the cell. In the descending limb of Henley's loop, the epithelium resembles that found in the glomerular capsule, and the commencement of the tube, consisting of flat, clear epithelial plates, each with an oval nucleus. The nuclei alternate on opposite sides of the tubule, so that the lumen remains fairly constant. In the straight tube, the epithelium is clear and cubical. In its papillary portion, the cells are distinctly columnar and transparent. The Renal Blood Vessels the kidney is plentifully supplied with blood by the renal artery, a large branch of the abdominal aorta. Before it enters the kidney, each artery divides into four or five branches, which at the hilum lie mainly between the renal vein and ureter, the vein being in front, the ureter behind. One branch usually lies behind the ureter. Each vessel gives off some small branches to the suprarenal glands, to the ureter, and to the surrounding cellular tissue and muscles. Frequently, a second renal artery, termed the inferior renal, is given off from the abdominal aorta at a lower level and supplies the lower portion of the kidney, while occasionally an additional artery enters the upper part of the kidney. The branches of the renal artery, while in the sinus, give off a few twigs for the nutrition of the surrounding tissues and end in the arteriae propriae renales, which enter the kidney proper in the renal columns. Two of these pass to each renal pyramid and run along its sides for its entire length, giving off in their course the afferent vessels of the renal corpuscles in the renal columns. Having arrived at the bases of the pyramids, they form arterial arches or arcades which lie in the boundary zone between the bases of the pyramids and the cortical arches, and break up into two distinct sets of branches devoted to the supply of the remaining portions of the kidney. The first set, the interlobular arteries, are given off at right angles from the side of the arterial arcade looking toward the cortical substance, and pass directly outward between the medullary rays to reach the fibrous tunic, where they end in the capillary network of this part. These vessels do not anastomose with each other, but form what are called end arteries. In their outward course they give off lateral branches. These are the afferent vessels for the renal corpuscles. They enter the capsule and end in the glomerulus. From each tuft, the corresponding efferent vessel arises, and having made its egress from the capsule, near to the point where the afferent vessel enters, breaks up into a number of branches, which form a dense plexus around the adjacent urinary tubes. The second set of branches from the arterial arcades supply the renal pyramids, which they enter at their bases, and passing straight through their substance to their apices, terminate in the venous plexuses found in that situation. They are called the arteriae recti. The efferent vessels from the glomeruli nearest the medulla break up into leashes of straight vessels, false arteriae recti, which pass down into the medulla and join the plexus of vessels there. The renal veins arise from three sources, namely the veins beneath the fibrous tunic, the plexuses around the convoluted tubules in the cortex, and the plexus is situated at the apices of the renal pyramids. The veins beneath the fibrous tunic, veni stellati, are stellate in arrangement, and are derived from the capillary network, into which the terminal branches of the interlobular arteries break up. These join to form the interlobular veins, which pass inward between the rays, receive branches from the plexuses around the convoluted tubules, and having arrived at the bases of the renal pyramids, join with the veni recti, next to be described. The veni recti are branches from the plexuses at the apices of the medullary pyramids, formed by the terminations of the arteriae recti. They run outward in a straight course between the tubes of the medullary substance, and joining, as above stated, the interlobular veins, form venous arcades, 
These in turn unite and form veins which pass along the sides of the pyramids. These vessels, veni proprii renales, accompany the arteries of the same name, running along the entire length of the sides of the pyramids, and quit the kidney substance to enter the sinus. In this cavity they join the corresponding veins from the other pyramids to form the renal vein, which emerges from the kidney at the hilum and opens into the inferior vena cava. The left vein is longer than the right, and crosses in front of the abdominal aorta. The lymphatics of the kidney are described on page 712. Nerves of the kidney. The nerves of the kidney, although small, are about fifteen in number. They have small ganglia developed upon them, and are derived from the renal plexus, which is formed by branches from the celiac plexus, the lower and outer part of the celiac ganglion and aortic plexus, and from the lesser and lowest splanchnic nerves. They communicate with the spermatic plexus, a circumstance which may explain the occurrence of pain in the testes in affections of the kidney. They accompany the renal artery and its branches, and are distributed to the blood vessels and to the cells of the urinary tubules. Connective Tissue Intertubular Stroma Although the tubules and vessels are closely packed, a small amount of connective tissue, continuous with the fibrous tunic, binds them firmly together and supports the blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Variations Malformations of the kidney are not uncommon. There may be an entire absence of one kidney, but according to Morris, the number of these cases is excessively small. Or there may be congenital atrophy of one kidney, when the kidney is very small, but usually healthy in structure. These cases are of great importance, and must be duly taken into account when nephrectomy is contemplated. A more common malformation is where the two kidneys are fused together. They may be joined together only at their lower ends by means of a thick mass of renal tissue, so as to form a horseshoe-shaped body, or they may be completely united, forming a disc-like kidney, from which two ureters descend into the bladder. These fused kidneys are generally situated in the middle line of the abdomen, but may be displaced as well. In some mammals, for example ox and bear, the kidney consists of a number of distinct lobules. This lobulated condition is characteristic of the kidney of the human fetus, and traces of it may persist in the adult. Sometimes the pelvis is duplicated, while a double ureter is not uncommon. In some rare instances, a third kidney may be present. One or both kidneys may be misplaced as a congenital condition, and remain fixed in this abnormal position. They are then very often misshapen. They may be situated higher, though this is very uncommon, or lower than normal, or removed farther from the vertebral column than usual. Or they may be displaced into the iliac fossa, over the sacroiliac joint, onto the promontory of the sacrum, or into the pelvis between the rectum and bladder, or by the side of the uterus. In these latter cases they may give rise to very serious trouble. The kidney may also be misplaced as a congenital condition, but may not be fixed. It is then known as a floating kidney. It is believed to be due to the fact that the kidney is completely enveloped by peritoneum, which then passes backward into the vertebral column as a double layer, forming a mesonephron which permits movement. The kidney may also be misplaced as an acquired condition. In these cases the kidney is mobile in the tissues by which it is surrounded, moving with the capsule in the paranephric tissues. This condition is known as movable kidney, and is more common in the female than in the male. It occurs in badly nourished people, or in those who have become emaciated from any cause. It must not be confounded with the floating kidney, which is a congenital condition due to the development of a mesonephron. The two conditions cannot, however, be distinguished until the abdomen is opened or the kidney explored from the loin. End of section 29section 30 of gray's anatomy part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by leanne howlett anatomy of the human body part 5 by henry gray the ureters 3b2 the ureters. 
The ureters are the two tubes which convey the urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Each commences within the sinus of the corresponding kidney as a number of short cup-shaped tubes, termed calyces, which encircle the renal papillae. Since a single calyx may enclose more than one papilla, the calyces are generally fewer in number than the pyramids, the former varying from 7 to 13, the latter from 8 to 18. The calyces join to form two or three short tubes, and these unite to form a funnel-shaped dilatation, wide above and narrow below, named the renal pelvis, which is situated partly inside and partly outside the renal sinus. It is usually placed on a level with the spinous process of the first lumbar vertebra. The ureter proper measures from 25 to 30 centimeters in length and is a thick-walled, narrow, cylindrical tube which is directly continuous near the lower end of the kidney with the tapering extremity of the renal pelvis. It runs downward and medialward in front of the psoas major and, entering the pelvic cavity, finally opens into the fundus of the bladder. The abdominal part, pars abdominalis, lies behind the peritoneum on the medial part of the psoas major and is crossed obliquely by the internal spermatic vessels. It enters the pelvic cavity by crossing either the termination of the common or the commencement of the external iliac vessels. At its origin, the right ureter is usually covered by the descending part of the duodenum and in its course downward lies to the right of the inferior vena cava and is crossed by the right colic and iliocolic vessels while near the superior aperture of the pelvis, it passes behind the lower part of the mesentery and the terminal part of the ilium. The left ureter is crossed by the left colic vessels, and near the superior aperture of the pelvis passes behind the sigmoid colon and its mesentery. The pelvic part, pars pelvina, runs at first downward on the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity along the anterior border of the greater sciatic notch and under cover of the peritoneum. It lies in front of the hypogastric artery medial to the obturator nerve and the umbilical, obturator, inferior vesicle, and middle hemorrhoidal arteries. Opposite the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen, it inclines medialward and reaches the lateral angle of the bladder where it is situated in front of the upper end of the seminal vesicle and at a distance of about five centimeters from the opposite ureter. Here the ductus deferens crosses to its medial side and the vesicle veins surround it. Finally, the ureter is run obliquely for about two centimeters through the wall of the bladder and opened by slit-like apertures into the cavity of the viscous at the lateral angles of the trigone. When the bladder is distended, the openings of the ureters are about 5 centimeters apart, but when it is empty and contracted, the distance between them is diminished by one half. Owing to their oblique course through the coats of the bladder, the upper and lower walls of the terminal portions of the ureters become closely applied to each other when the viscous is distended and, acting as valves, prevent regurgitation of urine from the bladder. In the female, the ureter forms, as it lies in relation to the wall of the pelvis, the posterior boundary of a shallow depression named the ovarian fossa, in which the ovary is situated. It then runs medialward and forward on the lateral aspect of the cervix uteri and upper part of the vagina to reach the fundus of the bladder. In this part of its course it is accompanied for about 2.5 centimeters by the uterine artery which then crosses in front of the ureter and ascends between the two layers of the broad ligament. The ureter is distant about two centimeters from the side of the cervix of the uterus. The ureter is sometimes duplicated on one or both sides and the two tubes may remain distinct as far as the fundus of the bladder. On rare occasions they open separately into the bladder cavity. Structure 
The ureter is composed of three coats, fibrous, muscular, and mucous coats. The fibrous coat, tunica adventitia, is continuous at one end with the fibrous tunic of the kidney on the floor of the sinus, while at the other it is lost in the fibrous structure of the bladder. In the renal pelvis, the muscular coat, tunica muscularis, consists of two layers, longitudinal and circular. The longitudinal fibers become lost upon the sides of the papillae at the extremities of the calyces. The circular fibers may be traced surrounding the medullary substance in the same situation. In the ureter proper, the muscular fibers are very distinct and are arranged in three layers, an external longitudinal, a middle circular, and an internal less distinct than the other two, but having a general longitudinal direction. According to Collicker, this internal layer is found only in the neighborhood of the bladder. The mucous coat, tunica mucosa, is smooth and presents a few longitudinal folds, which become effaced by distension. It is continuous with the mucous membrane of the bladder below, while it is prolonged over the papillae of the kidney above. Its epithelium is of a transitional character and resembles that found in the bladder. It consists of several layers of cells, of which the innermost, that is to say, the cells in contact with the urine, are somewhat flattened, with concavities on their deep surfaces, into which the rounded ends of the cells of the second layer fit. These, the intermediate cells, more or less resemble columnar epithelium, and are pear-shaped, with rounded internal extremities, which fit into the concavities of the cells of the first layer, and narrow external extremities which are wedged in between the cells of the third layer. The external or third layer consists of conical or oval cells varying in number in different parts, and presenting processes which extend down into the basement membrane. Beneath the epithelium, and separating it from the muscular coats, is a dense layer of fibrous tissue containing many elastic fibers. Vessels and Nerves the arteries supplying the ureter are branches from the renal, internal spermatic, hypogastric, and inferior vesicle. The nerves are derived from the inferior mesenteric, spermatic, and pelvic plexuses. Variations The upper portion of the ureter is sometimes double. More rarely it is double the greater part of its extent, or even completely so. In such cases there are two openings into the bladder. Asymmetry in these variations is common. End of section 30. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Section 31 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Urinary Bladder. Vesica Urinaria, Bladder. The urinary bladder is a muscular membranous sac, which acts as a reservoir for the urine, and as its size, position, and relations vary, according to the amount of fluid it contains, it is necessary to study it as it appears a when empty and b when distended. In both conditions, the position of the bladder varies with the condition of the rectum, being pushed upward and forward when the rectum is distended. The Empty Bladder When hardened in situ, the empty bladder has the form of a flattened tetrahedron with its vertex tilted forward. It presents a fundus, a vertex, a superior and an inferior surface. The fundus is triangular in shape, and is directed downward and backward toward the rectum, from which it is separated by the rectovesical fascia, the vesiculi seminales, and the terminal portions of the ductus deferentes. The vertex is directed forward, toward the upper part of the symphysis pubis, and from it the middle umbilical ligament is continued upward, on the back of the anterior abdominal wall, 
to the umbilicus. The peritoneum is carried by it from the vertex of the bladder on to the abdominal wall to form the middle umbilical fold. The superior surface is triangular, bounded on either side by a lateral border which separates it from the inferior surface, and behind by a posterior border, represented by a line joining the two ureters, which intervenes between it and the fundus. The lateral borders extend from the ureters to the vertex, and from them the peritoneum is carried to the walls of the pelvis. On either side of the bladder, the peritoneum shows a depression, named the paravesical fossa. The superior surface is directed upward, is covered by peritoneum, and is in relation with the sigmoid colon and some of the coils of the small intestine. When the bladder is empty and firmly contracted, the surface is convex and the lateral and posterior borders are rounded, whereas if the bladder be relaxed it is concave, and the interior of the viscous, as seen in a median sagittal section, presents the appearance of a V-shaped slit, with a shorter posterior and a longer anterior limb, the apex of the V corresponding with the internal orifice of the urethra. The inferior surface is directed downward, and is uncovered by peritoneum. It may be divided into a posterior or prostatic area, and two inferolateral surfaces. The prostatic area is somewhat triangular. It rests upon, and is in direct continuity with, the base of the prostate, and from it the urethra emerges. The inferolateral portions of the inferior surface are directed downward and lateralward. In front, they are separated from the symphysis pubis by a mass of fatty tissue, which is named the retropubic pad. Behind, they are in contact with the fascia, which covers the levatoris ani and obturatoris interni. When the bladder is empty, it is placed entirely within the pelvis, below the level of the obliterated hypogastric arteries, and below the level of those portions of the ductus deferentes which are in contact with the lateral wall of the pelvis. After they cross the ureters, the ductus deferentes come into contact with the fundus of the bladder. As the viscous fills, its fundus, being more or less fixed, is only slightly depressed, while its superior surface gradually rises into the abdominal cavity, carrying with it its peritoneal covering, and, at the same time, rounding off the posterior and lateral borders. THE DISTENDED BLADDER When the bladder is moderately full, it contains about 0.5 litres, and assumes an oval form. The long diameter of the oval measures about 12 centimetres, and is directed upward and forward. In this condition it presents a postero superior, an antero inferior, and two lateral surfaces, a fundus and a summit. The postero superior surface is directed upward and backward, and is covered by peritoneum. Behind, it is separated from the rectum by the rectovesical excavation, while its anterior part is in contact with the coils of the small intestine. The antero inferior surface is devoid of peritoneum, and rests below, against the pubic bones, above which it is in contact with the back of the anterior abdominal wall. The lower parts of the lateral surfaces are destitute of peritoneum, and are in contact with the lateral walls of the pelvis. The line of peritoneal reflection from the lateral surface is raised to the level of the obliterated hypogastric artery. The fundus undergoes little alteration in position, being only slightly lowered. It exhibits, however, a narrow triangular area, which is separated from the rectum merely by the rectovesical fascia. This area is bounded below by the prostate, above by the rectovesical fold of peritoneum, and laterally by the ductus deferentes. The ductus deferentes frequently come into contact with each other above the prostate, and under such circumstances the lower part of the triangular area is obliterated. The line of reflection of the peritoneum from the rectum to the bladder appears to undergo little or no change when the latter is distended. It is situated about ten centimetres from the anus. The summit is directed upward and forward, above the point of attachment of the middle umbilical ligament, and hence the peritoneum which follows the ligament forms a pouch of varying depth between the summit of the bladder 
and the anterior abdominal wall. The bladder in the child. In the newborn child, the internal urethral orifice is at the level of the upper border of the symphysis pubis. The bladder, therefore, lies relatively at a much higher level in the infant than in the adult. Its anterior surface is in contact with about the lower two-thirds of that part of the abdominal wall which lies between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. Symington. Its fundus is clothed with peritoneum as far as the level of the internal orifice of the urethra. Although the bladder of the infant is usually described as an abdominal organ, Symington has pointed out that only about one half of it lies above the plane of the superior aperture of the pelvis. Dis maintains that the internal urethral orifice sinks rapidly during the first years, and then more slowly until the ninth year, after which it remains stationary until puberty, when it again slowly descends and reaches its adult position. THE FEMALE BLADDER In the female, the bladder is in relation behind with the uterus and the upper part of the vagina. It is separated from the anterior surface of the body of the uterus by the vesicuterine excavation, but below the level of this excavation it is connected to the front of the cervix uteri, and the upper part of the anterior wall of the vagina by areola tissue. When the bladder is empty, the uterus rests upon its superior surface. The female bladder is said by some to be more capacious than that of the male, but probably the opposite is the case. Ligaments The bladder is connected to the pelvic wall by the fascia endopelvina. In front, this fascial attachment is strengthened by a few muscular fibres, the pubovesicales, which extend from the back of the pubic bones to the front of the bladder. Behind, other muscular fibres run from the fundus of the bladder to the sides of the rectum, in the sacrogenital folds, and constitute the rectovesicales. The vertex of the bladder is joined to the umbilicus by the remains of the urachus, which forms the middle umbilical ligament, a fibromuscular cord, broad at its attachment to the bladder, but narrowing as it ascends. From the superior surface of the bladder, the peritoneum is carried off in a series of folds, which are sometimes termed the false ligaments of the bladder. Anteriorly, there are three folds, the middle umbilical fold on the middle umbilical ligament, and two lateral umbilical folds on the obliterated hypogastric arteries. The reflections of the peritoneum onto the side walls of the pelvis form the lateral false ligaments, while the sacrogenital folds constitute posterior false ligaments. Interior of the bladder The mucous membrane lining the bladder is, over the greater part of the viscous, loosely attached to the muscular coat, and appears wrinkled or folded when the bladder is contracted. In the distended condition of the bladder, the folds are effaced. Over a small triangular area, termed the trigonum vesici, immediately above and behind the internal orifice of the urethra, the mucous membrane is firmly bound to the muscular coat, and is always smooth. The anterior angle of the trigonum vesici is formed by the internal orifice of the urethra, its posterolateral angles by the orifices of the ureters. Stretching behind the latter openings is a slightly curved ridge, the torus ureterecus, forming the base of the trigon, and produced by an underlying bundle of non-striped muscular fibres. The lateral parts of this ridge extend beyond the openings of the ureters, and are named the pleaky ureterici. They are produced by the terminal portions of the ureters as they traverse obliquely the bladder wall. When the bladder is illuminated, the torus ureterecus appears as a pale band, and forms an important guide during the operation of introducing a catheter into the ureter. The orifices of the ureters are placed at the posterolateral angles of the trigonum vesici, and are usually slit-like in form. In the contracted bladder they are about 2.5 cm apart, and about the same distance from the internal urethral orifice. In the distended viscous, these measurements may be increased to about 5 cm. 
the internal urethral orifice is placed at the apex of the trigonum vesici, in the most dependent part of the bladder, and is usually somewhat crescentic in form. The mucous membrane immediately behind it presents a slight elevation, the uvula vesici, caused by the middle lobe of the prostate. Structure The bladder is composed of the four coats, serous, muscular, submucous, and mucous coats. The serous coat, tunica serosa, is a partial one, and is derived from the peritoneum. It invests the superior surface and the upper parts of the lateral surfaces, and is reflected from these onto the abdominal and pelvic walls. The muscular coat, tunica muscularis, consists of three layers of unstriped muscular fibres, an external layer, composed of fibres having for the most part a longitudinal arrangement, a middle layer, in which the fibres are arranged more or less in a circular manner, and an internal layer, in which the fibres have a general longitudinal arrangement. The fibres of the external layer arise from the posterior surface of the body of the pubis in both sexes, musculi puba vesicales, and in the male from the adjacent part of the prostate and its capsule. They pass, in a more or less longitudinal manner, up the inferior surface of the bladder, over its vertex, and then descend along its fundus, to become attached to the prostate in the male, and to the front of the vagina in the female. At the sides of the bladder, the fibres are arranged obliquely, and intersect one another. This layer has been named the detrusa urinary muscle. The fibres of the middle circular layer are very thinly and irregularly scattered on the body of the organ, and, although to some extent placed transversely to the long axis of the bladder, are, for the most part, arranged obliquely. Toward the lower part of the bladder, around the internal urethral orifice, they are disposed in a thick circular layer, forming the sphincter vesici, which is continuous with the muscular fibres of the prostate. The internal longitudinal layer is thin, and its fasciculi have a reticular arrangement, but with a tendency to assume for the most part a longitudinal direction. Two bands of oblique fibres, originating behind the orifices of the ureters, converge to the back part of the prostate, and are inserted by means of a fibrous process into the middle lobe of that organ. They are the muscles of the ureters. Described by Sir C. Bell, who supposed that during the contraction of the bladder they serve to retain the oblique direction of the ureters, and so prevent the reflux of the urine into them. The submucous coat, tela submucosa, consists of a layer of areolar tissue, connecting together the muscular and mucous coats, and intimately united to the latter. The mucous coat, tunica mucosa, is thin, smooth, and of a pale rose colour. It is continuous above through the ureters with the lining membrane of the renal tubules, and below with that of the urethra. The loose texture of the submucous layer allows the mucous coat to be thrown into folds or rougi when the bladder is empty. Over the trigonum vesici, the mucous membrane is closely attached to the muscular coat and is not thrown into folds, but is smooth and flat. The epithelium covering it is of the transitional variety, consisting of a superficial layer of polyhedral flattened cells, each with one, two, or three nuclei. Beneath these is a stratum of large club-shaped cells, with their narrow extremities directed downward, and wedged in between smaller spindle-shaped cells, containing oval nuclei. The epithelium varies according as the bladder is distended or contracted, in the former condition, the superficial cells are flattened, and those of the other layers are shortened. In the latter, they present the appearance described above. There are no true glands in the mucous membrane of the bladder, though certain mucous follicles which exist, especially near the neck of the bladder, have been regarded as such. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the bladder are the superior, middle and inferior vesicle, derived from the anterior trunk of the hypogastric. The obturator and inferior gluteal arteries 
also supply small visceral branches to the bladder, and in the female additional branches are derived from the uterine and vaginal arteries. The veins form a complicated plexus on the inferior surface, and fundus near the prostate, and end in the hypogastric veins. The lymphatics are described in Part Three of Gray's Anatomy, Section 49. The nerves of the bladder are 1. Fine medulated fibres from the third and fourth sacral nerves, and 2. Non-medulated fibres from the hypogastric plexus. They are connected with ganglia in the outer and submucous coats, and are finally distributed, all as non-medulated fibres, to the muscular layer and epithelial lining of the viscous. Abnormalities A defect of development, in which the bladder is implicated, is known under the name of extraversion of the bladder. In this condition, the lower part of the abdominal wall and the anterior wall of the bladder are wanting, so that the fundus of the bladder presents on the abdominal surface, and is pushed forward by the pressure of the viscera within the abdomen, forming a red vascular tumour, on which the openings of the ureters are visible. The penis, except the glands, is rudimentary, and is cleft on its dorsal surface, exposing the floor of the urethra, a condition known as epispadius. The pelvic bones are also arrested in development. End of section 31、section、of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part Five by Henry Gray. The Male Urethra, the Female Urethra. The Male Urethra, Urethra Virilis. The male urethra extends from the internal urethral orifice in the urinary bladder to the external urethral orifice at the end of the penis. It presents a double curve in the ordinary relaxed state of the penis. Its length varies from seventeen point five to twenty centimeters, and it is divided into three portions: the prostatic, membranous, and cavernous. The structure and relations of which are essentially different, except during the passage of the urine or semen, the greater part of the urethral canal is a mere transverse cleft or slit, with its upper and under surfaces in contact. At the external orifice, the slit is vertical, in the membranous portion irregular or stellate, and in the prostatic portion somewhat arched. The prostatic portion, pars prostatica, the widest and most dilatable part of the canal, is about three centimeters long. It runs almost vertically through the prostate from its base to its apex, lying nearer its anterior than its posterior surface. The form of the canal is spindle-shaped, being wider in the middle than at either extremity, and narrowest below. Where it joins the membranous portion, a transverse section of the canal, as it lies in the prostate, is horseshoe-shaped, with the convexity directed forward. Upon the posterior wall or floor is a narrow longitudinal ridge, the urethral crest, veromontanum, formed by an elevation of the mucous membrane and its subjacent tissue. It is from fifteen to seventeen millimeters in length, and about three millimeters in height, and contains, according to Cobalt, muscular and erectile tissue. When distended, it may serve to prevent the passage of the semen backward into the bladder. On either side of the crest is a slightly depressed fossa, the prostatic sinus, the floor of which is perforated by numerous apertures. The orifices of the prostatic ducts from the lateral lobes of the prostate, the ducts of the middle lobe open behind the crest. At the forepart of the urethral crest, below its summit, 
is a median elevation the colliculus seminalis upon or within the margins of which are the orifices of the prostatic utricle and the slit-like openings of the ejaculatory ducts the prostatic utricle sinus pocularis forms a cul-de-sac about six millimeters long which runs upward and backward in the substance of the prostate behind the middle lobe its walls are composed of fibrous tissue muscular fibers and mucous membrane and numerous small glands open on its inner surface it was called by weber the uterus masculinus from its being developed from the united lower ends of the atrophied molarian ducts and therefore homologous with the uterus and vagina in the female the membranous portion pars membranacea is the shortest least dilatable and with the exception of the external orifice the narrowest part of the canal it extends downward and forward with a slight anterior concavity between the apex of the prostate and the bulb of the urethra perforating the urogenital diaphragm about two point five centimeters below and behind the pubic symphysis the hinder part of the urethral bulb lies in apposition with the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm but its upper portion diverges somewhat from this fascia the anterior wall of the membranous urethra is thus prolonged for a short distance in front of the urogenital diaphragm it measures about two centimeters in length while the posterior wall which is between the two fasciae of the diaphragm is only one point twenty five centimeters long the membranous portion of the urethra is completely surrounded by the fibers of the sphincter urethrae membranaceae in front of it the deep dorsal vein of the penis enters the pelvis between the transverse ligament of the pelvis and the arcuate pubic ligament on either side near its termination are the bulbal urethral glands the cavernous portion pars cavernosa penile or spongy portion is the longest part of the urethra and is contained in the corpus cavernosum urethra it is about fifteen centimeters long and extends from the termination of the membranous portion to the external urethral orifice commencing below the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm it passes forward and upward to the front of the symphysis pubis and then in the flaccid condition of the penis it bends downward and forward it is narrow and of uniform size in the body of the penis measuring about six millimeters in diameter it is dilated behind within the bulb and again anteriorly within the glans penis where it forms the fossa navicularis urethra the external urethral orifice orificium urethrae externum medis urinarius is the most contracted part of the urethra it is a vertical slit about six millimeters long bounded on either side by two small labia the lining membrane of the urethra especially on the floor of the cavernous portion presents the orifices of numerous mucous glands and follicles situated in the submucous tissue and named the urethral glands litre besides these are a number of small pit-like recesses or lacunae of varying sizes their orifices are directed forward so that they may easily intercept the point of a catheter in its passage along the canal one of these lacunae larger than the rest is situated on the upper surface of the fossus navicularis it is called the lacuna magna the bulbal urethral glands open into the cavernous portion about two point five centimeters in front of the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm structure the urethra is composed of mucous membrane supported by a submucous tissue which connects it with the various structures through which it passes the mucous coat forms part of the genito urinary mucous membrane 
it is continuous with the mucous membrane of the bladder ureters and kidneys externally with the integument covering the glans penis and is prolonged into the ducts of the glands which open into the urethra viz the bulbal urethral glands and the prostate and into the ductus deferentes and vesculae seminales through the ejaculatory ducts in the cavernous and membranous portions the mucous membrane is arranged in longitudinal folds when the tube is empty small papillae are found upon it near the external urethral orifice its epithelial lining is of the columnar variety except near the external orifice where it is squamous and stratified the submucous tissue consists of a vascular erectile layer outside this is a layer of unstriped muscular fibers arranged in a circular direction which separates the mucous membrane and submucous tissue from the tissue of the corpus cavernosum urethrae congenital defects of the urethra occur occasionally the one most frequently met with is where there is a cleft on the floor of the urethra owing to an arrest of union in the middle line this is known as hypospadias and the cleft may vary in extent the simplest and by far the most common form is where the deficiency is confined to the glans penis the urethra ends at the point where the extremity of the prepuce joins the body of the penis in a small valve-like opening the prepuce is also cleft on its under surface and forms a sort of hood over the glands there is a depression on the glands in the position of the normal metis this condition produces no disability and requires no treatment in more severe cases the cavernous portion of the urethra is cleft throughout its entire length and the opening of the urethra is at the point of junction of the penis and scrotum the under surface of the penis in the middle line presents a furrow lined by a moist mucous membrane on either side of which is often more or less dense fibrous tissue stretching from the glands to the opening of the urethra which prevents complete erection taking place great discomfort is induced during micturition and sexual connection is impossible the condition may be remedied by a series of plastic operations the worst form of this condition is where the urethra is deficient as far back as the perineum and the scrotum is cleft the penis is small and bound down between the two halves of the scrotum so as to resemble a hypertrophied clitoris the testes are often retained the condition of parts therefore very much resembles the external organs of generation of the female and many children the victims of this malformation have been brought up as girls the halves of the scrotum deficient of testes resemble the labia the cleft between them looks like the orifice of the vagina and the diminutive penis is taken for an enlarged clitoris there is no remedy for this condition a much more uncommon form of malformation is where there is an apparent deficiency of the upper wall of the urethra this is named epispadias the deficiency may vary in extent when it is complete the condition is associated with extraversion of the bladder in less extensive cases where there is no extraversion there is an infundibuliform opening into the bladder the penis is usually dwarfed and turned upward so that the glands lies over the opening congenital stricture is also occasionally met with and in such cases multiple strictures may be present throughout the whole length of the cavernous portion the female urethra urethra mulibris the female urethra is a narrow membranous canal about four centimeters long extending from the internal to the external urethral orifice it is placed behind the symphysis pubis embedded in the anterior wall of the vagina and its direction is obliquely downward and forward it is slightly curved with the concavity directed forward its diameter when undilated is about six millimeters 
it perforates the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm and its external orifice is situated directly in front of the vaginal opening and about two point five centimeters behind the glans clitoridis the lining membrane is thrown into longitudinal folds one of which placed along the floor of the canal is termed the urethral crest many small urethral glands open into the urethra structure the urethra consists of three coats muscular erectile and mucus the muscular coat is continuous with that of the bladder it extends the whole length of the tube and consists of circular fibers in addition to this between the superior and inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm the female urethra is surrounded by the sphincter urethrae membranicae as in the male a thin layer of spongy erectile tissue containing a plexus of large veins intermixed with bundles of unstriped muscular fibers lies immediately beneath the mucous coat the mucous coat is pale it is continuous externally with that of the vulva and internally with that of the bladder it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium which becomes transitional near the bladder its external orifice is surrounded by a few mucus follicles End of section thirty two of Gray's Anatomy Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5 by Henry Gray. The Male Genital Organs. Organa Genitalia Virilia. The male genitals include the testes, the ductus deferentes, the vesiculi seminalis, the ejaculatory ducts, and the penis, together with the following accessory structures, namely the prostate and the bulbo-urethral glands. The testes and their coverings. The testes are two glandular organs which secrete the semen. They are suspended in the scrotum by the spermatic cords. At an early period of fetal life, the testes are contained in the abdominal cavity, behind the peritoneum. Before birth, they descend to the inguinal canal, along which they pass with the spermatic cord, and, emerging at the subcutaneous inguinal ring, they descend into the scrotum, becoming invested in their course by coverings derived from the serous, muscular, and fibrous layers of the abdominal parietes, as well as by the scrotum. The coverings of the testes are the skin, cremaster, scrotum, dartos tunic, infundibuliform fascia, intercrural fascia, tunica vaginalis. The scrotum is a cutaneous pouch which contains the testes and parts of the spermatic cords. It is divided on its surface into two lateral portions by a ridge or raphe which is continued forward to the under surface of the penis and backward along the middle line of the perineum to the anus. Of these two lateral portions the left hangs lower than the right to correspond with the greater length of the left spermatic cord. Its external aspect varies under different circumstances. Thus, under the influence of warmth, and in old and debilitated persons, it becomes elongated and flaccid. But under the influence of cold, and in the young and robust, it is short, corrugated, and closely applied to the testes. The scrotum consists of two layers, the integument and the dartos tunic. The integument is very thin, of a brownish color, and generally thrown into folds or rugae. It is provided with sebaceous follicles, the secretion of which has a peculiar odor, and is beset with thinly scattered crisp hairs, the roots of which are seen through the skin. The dartos tunic, tunica dartos, is a thin layer of non-striped muscular fibers, continuous around the base of the scrotum, with the two layers of the superficial fascia of the groin and the perineum. It sends inward a septum, which divides the scrotal pouch into two cavities for the testes, and extends between the raphe and the undersurface of the penis as far as its root. The dartos tunic is closely united to the skin externally, but connected with the sub-adjacent parts by delicate areolar tissue, 
upon which it glides with the greatest facility. The intercrural fascia, intercolumnar or external spermatic fascia, is a thin membrane, prolonged downward around the surface of the cord and testis. It is separated from the dartos tunic by loose areolar tissue. The cremaster consists of scattered bundles of muscular fibers connected together into a continuous covering by intermediate areolar tissue. The infundibuliform fascia, tunica vaginalis communis, testis et funiculi spermatici, is a thin layer which loosely invests the cord. It is a continuation downward of the transversalis fascia. The tunica vaginalis is described with the testes. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the coverings of the testes are the superficial and deep external pudendal branches of the femoral, the superficial perineal branch of the internal pudendal, and the cremasteric branch from the inferior epigastric. The veins follow the course of the corresponding arteries. The lymphatics end in the inguinal lymph glands. The nerves are the ilioinguinal and lumboinguinal branches of the lumbar plexus, the two superficial perineal branches of the internal pudendal nerve and the pudendal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. The inguinal canal, canalis inguinalis, is described on page 418. The spermatic cord, funiculus spermaticus, extends from the abdominal inguinal ring where the structures of which it is composed converge to the back part of the testis. In the abdominal wall, the cord passes obliquely along the inguinal canal, lying at first beneath the obliquus internus and upon the fascia transversalis, but nearer the pubis it rests upon the inguinal and lacunar ligaments, having the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus in front of it and the inguinal falcs behind it. It then escapes at the subcutaneous ring and descends nearly vertically into the scrotum. The left cord is rather longer than the right, consequently the left testis hangs somewhat lower than its fellow. Structure of the spermatic cord The spermatic cord is composed of arteries, veins, lymphatics, nerves, and the excretory duct of the testis. These structures are connected together by areolar tissue and invested by the layers brought down by the testis in its descent. The arteries of the cord are the internal and external spermatics, and the artery to the ductus deferens. The internal spermatic artery, a branch of the abdominal aorta, escapes from the abdomen at the abdominal inguinal ring and accompanies the other constituents of the spermatic cord along the inguinal canal and through the subcutaneous inguinal ring into the scrotum. It then descends to the testis and, becoming tortuous, divides into several branches, two or three of which accompany the ductus deferens and supply the epididymis, anastomosing with the artery of the ductus deferens. The others supply the substance of the testis. The external spermatic artery is a branch of the inferior epigastric artery. It accompanies the spermatic cord and supplies the coverings of the cord, anastomosing with the internal sp spermatic artery. The artery of the ductus deferens, a branch of the superior vesicle, is a long slender vessel which accompanies the ductus deferens, ramifying upon its coats and anastomosing with the internal spermatic artery near the testis. The spermatic veins emerge from the back of the testis and receive tributaries from the epididymis. They unite and form a convoluted plexus, the plexus pampiniformis, which forms the chief mass of the cord. The vessels composing this plexus are very numerous and ascend along the cord in front of the ductus deferens. Below the subcutaneous inguinal ring they unite to form three or four veins which pass along the inguinal canal and entering the abdomen through the abdominal inguinal ring coalesce to form two veins. These again unite to form a single vein which opens on the right side into the inferior vena cava at an acute angle and on the left side into the left renal vein at a right angle. The lymphatic vessels are described on page 713. The nerves are the spermatic plexus from the sympathetic, joined by filaments from the pelvic plexus, which accompany the artery of the ductus deferens. The scrotum forms an admirable covering for the protection of the testes. These bodies, lying suspended and loose in the cavity of the scrotum and surrounded by serous membrane, are capable of great mobility and can therefore easily slip about within the scrotum and thus avoid injuries from blows or squeezes.
The skin of the scrotum is very elastic, and capable of great distension, and on account of the looseness and amount of subcutaneous tissue, the scrotum becomes greatly enlarged in cases of edema, to which this part is especially liable as a result of its dependent position. The testes are suspended in the scrotum by the spermatic cords, the left testis hanging somewhat lower than its fellow. The average dimensions of the testis are from 4 to 5 centimeters in length, 2.5 centimeters in breadth, and 3 centimeters in the antero-posterior diameter. Its weight varies from 10.5 to 14 grams. Each testis is of an oval form, compressed laterally, and having an oblique position in the scrotum. The upper extremity is directed forward and a little lateral ward, the lower backward and a little medial ward. The anterior convex border looks forward and downward, the posterior or straight border to which the cord is attached backward and upward. The anterior border and lateral surfaces, as well as both extremities of the organ, are convex, free, smooth, and invested by the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. The posterior border, to which the cord is attached, receives only a partial investment from that membrane. Lying upon the lateral edge of this posterior border is a long, narrow, flattened body named the epididymis. The epididymis consists of a central portion or body, an upper enlarged extremity, the head, globus major, and a lower pointed extremity, the tail, globus minor, which is continuous with the ductus deferens, the duct of the testis. The head is intimately connected with the upper end of the testis by means of the efferent ductules of the gland. The tail is connected with the lower end by cellular tissue and a reflection of the tunica vaginalis. The lateral surface, head and tail of the epididymis are free and covered by the serous membrane. The body is also completely invested by it, excepting along its posterior border, while between the body and the testis is a pouch named the sinus of the epididymis, digital fossa. The epididymis is connected to the back of the testis by a fold of the serous membrane. End of section 33. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Testes and Their Coverings. Appendages of the Testis and Epididymis. On the upper extremity of the testis, just beneath the head of the epididymis, is a minute oval sessile body, the appendix of the testis, hydatid of morgagni. It is the remnant of the upper end of the mullarian duct. On the head of the epididymis is a second small stalked appendage, sometimes duplicated. It is named the appendix of the epididymis, pedunculated hydatid, and is usually regarded as a detached efferent duct. The testis is invested by three tunics, the tunica vaginalis, tunica albuginea, and tunica vasculosa. The tunica vaginalis, tunica vaginalis propria testis, is the serous covering of the testis. It is a pouch of serous membrane derived from the saccus vaginalis of the peritoneum, which in the fetus preceded the descent of the testis from the abdomen into the scrotum. After its descent, that portion of the pouch which extends from the abdominal inguinal ring to near the upper part of the gland becomes obliterated. The lower portion remains as a shut sac which invests the surface of the testis and is reflected on to the internal surface of the scrotum. Hence it may be described as consisting of a visceral and a parietal lamina. The visceral lamina, or lamina visceralis, covers the greater part of the testis and epididymis connecting the latter to the testis by means of a distinct fold. From the posterior border of the gland, it is reflected on to the internal surface of the scrotum. The parietal lamina, or lamina parietalis, is far more extensive than the visceral, extending upward for some distance in front and on the medial side of the cord and reaching below the testis. 
The inner surface of the tunica vaginalis is smooth and covered by a layer of endothelial cells. The interval between the visceral and parietal laminae con constitutes the cavity of the tunica vaginalis. The obliterated portion of the saccus vaginalis may generally be seen as a fibrocellular thread lying in the loose areolar tissue around the spermatic cord. Sometimes this may be traced as a distinct band from the upper end of the inguinal canal where it is connected with the peritoneum down to the tunica vaginalis. Sometimes it gradually becomes lost on the spermatic cord. Occasionally no trace of it can be detected. In some cases it happens that the pouch of peritoneum does not become obliterated, but the sac of the peritoneum communicates with the tunica vaginalis. This may give rise to one of the varieties of oblique inguinal hernia. In other cases, the pouch may contract, but not become entirely obliterated. It then forms a minute canal leading from the peritoneum to the tunica vaginalis. The tunica albuginea is the fibrous covering of the testis. It is a dense membrane of a bluish-white color composed of bundles of white fibrous tissue which interlace in every direction. It is covered by the tunica vaginalis, except at the points of attachment of the epididymis to the testis and along its posterior border, where the spermatic vessels enter the gland. It is applied to the tunica vasculosa over the glandular substance of the testis and, at its posterior border, is reflected into the interior of the gland, forming an incomplete vertical septum called the mediastinum testis, or corpus hymori. The mediastinum testis extends from the upper to near the lower extremity of the gland and is wider above than below. From its front and sides, numerous imperfect septa, or trabeculi, are given off, which radiate toward the surface of the organ and are attached to the tunica albuginea. They divide the interior of the organ into a number of incomplete spaces, which are somewhat cone-shaped, being broad at their base at the surface of the gland, and becoming narrower as they converge to the mediastinum. The mediastinum supports the vessels and duct of the testis in their passage to and from the substance of the gland. The tunica vasculosa is the vascular layer of the testis, consisting of a plexus of blood vessels held together by delicate areolar tissue. It clothes the inner surface of the tunica albuginea and the different septa in the interior of the gland, and therefore forms an internal investment to all the spaces of which the gland is composed. Structure The glandular structure of the testis consists of numerous lobules. Their number in a single testis is estimated by Barris at 250 and by Krauss at 400. They differ in size according to their position, those in the middle of the gland being larger and longer. The lobules are conical in shape, the base being directed toward the circumference of the organ, the apex toward the mediastinum. Each lobule is contained in one of the intervals between the fibrous septa, which extend between the mediastinum testis and the tunica albuginea, and consists of from one to three or more minute convoluted tubes, the tubuli seminiferi. The tubules may be separately unraveled by careful dissection under water, and may be seen to commence either by free cecal ends or by anastomotic loops. They are supported by loose connective tissue, which contains here and there groups of interstitial cells containing yellow pigment granules. The total number of tubules is estimated by Louth at 840, and the average length of each is 70 to 80 centimeters. Their diameter varies from 0 0.12 to 0 0.3 millimeters. The tubules are pale in color in early life, but in old age they acquire a deep yellow tinge from containing much fatty matter. Each tubule consists of a basement layer formed of laminated connective tissue containing numerous elastic fibers with flattened cells between the layers and covered externally by a layer of flattened epithelioid cells. Within the basement membrane are epithelial cells arranged in several irregular layers, which are not always clearly separated, but which may be arranged in three different groups. Among these cells may be seen the spermatozoa in different stages of development. Lining the basement membrane and forming the outer zone is a layer of cubical cells with small nuclei. Some of these enlarge to become spermatogonia. The nuclei of some of the spermatogonia may be seen to be in process of indirect division, or karyokinesis, 
and in consequence of this, daughter cells are formed, which constitute the second zone. Within this first layer is to be seen a number of larger polyhedral cells with clear nuclei arranged in two or three layers. These are the intermediate cells or spermatocytes. Most of these cells are in a condition of karyokinetic division and the cells which result from this division form those of the next layer, the spermatoblasts or spermatids. The third layer of cells consists of the spermatoblasts or spermatids, and each of these, without further subdivision, becomes a spermatozoan. The spermatids are small polyhedral cells, the nucleus of each of which contains half the usual number of chromosomes. In addition to these three layers of cells, others are seen, which are termed the supporting cells, or cells of Sertoli. They are elongated and columnar and project inward from the basement membrane toward the lumen of the tube. As development of the spermatozoa proceeds, the latter group themselves around the inner extremities of the supporting cells. The nuclear portion of the spermatid, which is partly embedded in the supporting cell, is differentiated to form the head of the spermatozoan, while part of the cell protoplasm forms the middle piece and the tail is produced by an outgrowth from the double centriole of the cell. Ultimately, the heads are liberated and the spermatozoa are set free. The structure of the spermatozoa is described on pages 42 and 43. In the apices of the lobules, the tubules become less convoluted, assume a nearly straight course, and unite together to form from 20 to 30 larger ducts of about 0.5 millimeters in diameter, and these, from their straight course, are called tubuli recti. The tubuli recti enter the fibrous tissue of the mediastinum and pass upward and backward, forming, in their ascent, a close network of anastomosing tubes which are merely channels in the fibrous stroma, lined by flattened epithelium and having no proper walls. This constitutes the rete testis. At the upper end of the mediastinum, the vessels of the rete testis terminate in from 12 to 15 or 20 ducts, the ductuli efferentes. They perforate the tunica albuginea and carry the seminal fluid from the testis to the epididymis. Their course is at first straight, they then become enlarged and exceedingly convoluted and form a series of conical masses, the coni vasculosi, which together constitute the head of the epididymis. Each cone consists of a single convoluted duct from 15 to 20 centimeters in length, the diameter of which gradually decreases from the testis to the epididymis. Opposite the bases of the cones, the efferent vessels open at narrow intervals into a single duct, which constitutes, by its complex convolutions, the body and tail of the epididymis. When the convolutions of this tube are unraveled, it measures upward of six meters in length. It decreases in diameter and thickness as it approaches the ductus deferens. The convolutions are held together by fine areolar tissue and by bands of fibrous tissue. The tubuli recti have very thin walls. Like the channels of the rete testis, they are lined by a single layer of flattened epithelium. The ductuli efferentes and the tube of the epididymis have walls of considerable thickness on account of the presence in them of muscular tissue, which is principally arranged in a circular manner. These tubes are lined by columnar ciliated epithelium. Peculiarities the testis, developed in the lumbar region, may be arrested or delayed in its transit to the scrotum, cryptorchism. It may be retained in the abdomen, or it may be arrested at the abdominal inguinal ring, or in the inguinal canal, or it may just pass out of the subcutaneous inguinal ring without finding its way to the bottom of the scrotum. When retained in the abdomen, it gives rise to no symptoms other than the absence of the testis from the scrotum. But when it is retained in the inguinal canal, it is subjected to pressure and may become inflamed and painful. The retained testis is probably functionally useless, so that a man in whom both testes are retained, anorchism, is sterile, though he may not be impotent. The absence of one testis is termed monorchism. When a testis is retained in the inguinal canal, it is often complicated with a congenital hernia, the funicular process of the peritoneum not being obliterated. In addition to the cases above described, where there is some arrest in the descent of the testis, this organ may descend through the inguinal canal, 
but may miss the scrotum and assume some abnormal position. The most common form is where the testis, emerging at the subcutaneous inguinal ring, slips down between the scrotum and the thigh and comes to rest in the perineum. This is known as perineal ectopia testis. With each variety of abnormality in the position of the testis, it is very common to find concurrently a congenital hernia, or, if a hernia be not actually present, the funicular process is usually patent, and almost invariably so if the testis is in the inguinal canal. The testis, finally reaching the scrotum, may occupy an abnormal position in it. It may be inverted so that its posterior or attached border is directed forward and the tunica vaginalis is situated behind. Fluid collections of a serous character are very frequently found in the scrotum. To these the term hydrocele is applied. The most common form is the ordinary vaginal hydrocele, in which the fluid is contained in the sac of the tunica vaginalis, which is separated in its normal condition from the peritoneal cavity by the whole extent of the inguinal canal. In another form, the congenital hydrocele, the fluid is in the sac of the tunica vaginalis, but this cavity communicates with the general peritoneal cavity, its tubular process remaining pervious. A third variety, known as an infantile hydrocele, occurs in those cases where the tubular process becomes obliterated only at its upper part, at or near the abdominal inguinal ring. It resembles the vaginal hydrocele, except as regards its shape, the collection of fluid extending up to the cord into the inguinal canal. Fourthly, the funicular process may become obliterated both at the abdominal inguinal ring and above the epididymis, leaving a central unobliterated portion which may become distended with fluid, giving rise to a condition known as the encysted hydrocele of the cord. End of section 34. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. deference, or the vast deference, or the seminal duct. The ductus deferens, the excretory duct of the testis, is the continuation of the canal of the epididymis. Commencing at the lower part of the tail of the epididymis, it is at first very tortuous, but gradually becoming less twisted, it ascends along the posterior border of the testis and medial side of the epididymis, and, as a constituent of the spermatic cord, traverses the inguinal canal to the abdominal inguinal ring. Here it separates from the other structures of the cord, curves around the lateral side of the inferior epigastric artery, and ascends for about 2.5 centimeters in front of the external iliac artery. It is next directed backward and slightly downward, and, crossing the external iliac vessels obliquely, enters the pelvic cavity, where it lies between the peritoneal membrane and the lateral wall of the pelvis, and descends on the medial side of the obliterated umbilical artery and the obturator nerve and vessels. It then crosses in front of the ureter, and reaching the medial side of this tube, bends to form an acute angle, and runs medialward and slightly forward between the fundus of the bladder and the upper end of the seminal vesicle. Reaching the medial side of the seminal vesicle, it is directed downward and medialward in contact with it, gradually approaching the opposite ductus. Here it lies between the fundus of the bladder and the rectum, where it is enclosed, together with the seminal vesicle, in a sheath derived from the rectovesical portion of the fascia endopelvina. Lastly, it is directed downward to the base of the prostate, where it becomes greatly narrowed and is joined at an acute angle by the duct of the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct, which traverses the prostate behind its middle lobe and opens into the prostatic portion of the urethra, close to the orifice of the prostatic utricle. The ductus deferens presents a hard and cord-like sensation to the fingers and is of cylindrical form. Its walls are dense and its canal is extremely small. At the fundus of the bladder it becomes enlarged and tortuous, and this portion is termed the ampulla. A small triangular area of the fundus of the bladder, between the ductus deferentes laterally and the bottom of the rectovesical excavation of peritoneum above, is in contact with the rectum. Ductuli aberrantes a long narrow tube, the ductulus aberrans inferior, or vas aberrans of Haller, 
is occasionally found connected with the lower part of the canal of the epididymis, or with the commencement of the ductus deferens. Its length varies from 3.5 to 35 centimeters, and it may become dilated toward its extremity. More commonly, it retains the same diameter throughout. Its structure is similar to that of the ductus deferens. Occasionally, it is found unconnected with the epididymis. A second tube, the ductulus aberrans superior, occurs in the head of the epididymis. It is connected with the rete testis. Paradidymis, or organ of Giraldis. This term is applied to a small collection of convoluted tubules situated in front of the lower part of the cord above the head of the epididymis. These tubes are lined with columnar ciliated epithelium and probably represent the remains of a part of the Wolfian body. Structure. The ductus deferens consists of three coats. Number one, an external or areolar coat. Number two, a muscular coat, which in the greater portion of the tube consists of two layers of unstriped muscular fiber, an outer longitudinal in direction and an inner circular. But in addition to these, at the commencement of the ductus, there is a third layer, consisting of longitudinal fibers, placed internal to the circular stratum between it and the mucous membrane. Number three, an internal or mucous coat, which is pale and arranged in longitudinal folds. The mucous coat is lined by columnar epithelium, which is non-ciliated throughout the greater part of the tube. A variable portion of the testicular end of the tube is lined by two strata of columnar cells, and the cells of the superficial layer are ciliated. Next chapter, the vesiculi seminales, or seminal vesicles. The vesiculi seminales are two lobulated membranous pouches placed between the fundus of the bladder and the rectum, serving as reservoirs for the semen and secreting a fluid to be added to the secretion of the testes. Each sac is somewhat pyramidal in form, the broad end being directed backward, upward, and lateralward. It is usually about 7.5 centimeters long, but varies in size, not only in different individuals, but also in the same individual on the two sides. The anterior surface is in contact with the fundus of the bladder, extending from near the termination of the ureter to the base of the prostate. The posterior surface rests upon the rectum, from which it is separated by the rectovesical fascia. The upper extremities of the two vesicles diverge from each other, and are in relation with the ductus deferentes and the terminations of the ureters, and are partly covered by peritoneum. The lower extremities are pointed and converge toward the base of the prostate, where each joins with the corresponding ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. Along the medial margin of each vesicle runs the ampulla of the ductus deferens. Each vesicle consists of a single tube coiled upon itself and giving off several irregular cecal diverticula. The separate coils, as well as the diverticula, are connected together by fibrous tissue. When uncoiled, the tube is about the diameter of a quill and varies in length from 10 to 15 centimeters. It ends posteriorly in a cul-de-sac. Its anterior extremity becomes constricted into a narrow, straight duct, which joins with the corresponding ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. Structure The vesiculi seminales are composed of three coats, an external or areolar coat, a middle or muscular coat thinner than in the ductus deferens and arranged in two layers, an outer longitudinal and an inner circular, an internal or mucous coat which is pale of a whitish brown color and presents a delicate reticular structure. The epithelium is columnar and in the diverticula goblet cells are present, the secretion of which increases the bulk of the seminal fluid. Vessels and Nerves the arteries supplying the vesiculi seminales are derived from the middle and inferior vesicle and middle hemorrhoidal. The veins and lymphatics accompany the arteries. The nerves are derived from the pelvic plexuses. The next chapter is the ejaculatory ducts, or ductus ejaculatorii. The ejaculatory ducts are two in number, one on either side of the middle line. Each is formed by the union of the duct from the vesicula seminalis with the ductus deferens and is about 2 centimeters long. 
They commence at the base of the prostate and run forward and downward between its middle and lateral lobes and along the sides of the prostatic utricle to end by separate slit-like orifices close to or just within the margins of the utricle. The ducts diminish in size and also converge toward their terminations. Structure. The coats of the ejaculatory ducts are extremely thin. They are an outer fibrous layer which is almost entirely lost after the entrance of the ducts into the prostate, a layer of muscular fibers consisting of a thin outer circular and an inner longitudinal layer, and mucous membrane. End of section 35. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross.